Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the OPT Network. This morning, we're sharing a story that it could be fiction, but it's really a true story. Our guest this morning is Dr. Gail Lukasik. She's an award-winning writer, mystery writer, and little did Dr. Lukasik know that the writer of mysteries would have to unravel, solve, and write her own family's mystery. Now, this mystery and journey takes her from Parma, Ohio, to New Orleans, Louisiana, to right here in Alexandria. And briefly, here's the story. The book is entitled, White Like Her, My Family's Story of Race and Racial Passing. It's a story that Gail's mother had of passing and Gail's struggle with the shame of her mother's choice and the subsequent journey to self-discovery and redemption. We welcome Dr. Lukasik to the OPT Network. Dr. Gail, good morning and welcome. Good morning and thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. Dr. Gail, it is a story that it, 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 it rivals stories that we have, have seen in movies and have heard about and it just happens to be your story of your mother passing for white. So I want to rewind back to when you got an inkling that there was an issue or that there was something that was awry with your mother and a secret that she was keeping. I think in the, I, I didn't know consciously but I think uh, growing up, my mother was so secretive about her father, Azima Frederick. And every time I would ask her about him, she would be very evasive and say things like, well, my parents divorced when I was six and I didn't grow up with my dad. So I really don't know a lot about him. Then I would say, well, don't you have a photograph, <laughs> something that I could look at? Uh -huh. And she says, oh, no, no, I have no photographs. So I thought that was strange. And then I asked her, well, can we visit New Orleans, your hometown? Oh, no, I, I don't want to go to New Orleans. It depresses me too much. So as a child, I let that go. However, um, it was always in the back of my mind. Who is my grandfather? What was he like? What did he look like? What did he do for a living? So um, when I, in 1995, I was already an adult, I already had completed my graduate work and was teaching, and I had a little interim time between teaching jobs. Be before, before you go there, Dr. Gale, okay. I, I, want, I want to stay in sort of that place of okay. that girl who was growing up, who had all of these questions, but sort of noticed some things about your mother and how meticulous she was. In the book, you write that she wore makeup and she was she was always almost picture perfect but wore makeup to bed and 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 was just took great care in staying out of the sun and you know things like that that could seem a little bit odd when you experienced those things what did you think well you have to remember i'm a child <laughs> so i have not a lot of reference i don't have a lot of other I mean, I just thought my mother had these quirky behaviors. Mm -hmm. She never went in the sun unless she had a hat on. Um, and she rarely went in the sun. She avoided the sun. Um, yes, she wore makeup to bed. And I asked her about it. I said, Mom, how come you wear makeup to bed? And she said, well, Gail, you never know. If you get sick in the middle of the night, <laughs> this is what she said to me, you know, the ambulance will come and you want to look your best because you'll get better treatment at the hospital. Now, I did think that was odd, but I just thought, well, that's my mom. You know, she has these quirky behaviors. And um, and she was, like I said, secretive about her father. So mm -hmm. I, I just thought, well, that's her. You kind of accept it. So when, when she's secretive about her father, do you ever turn to your father and say, hey, Dad, you know, why don't we know more about mom's family? I never did. I, I seriously never did. Um, I, you know, my mother's mother um, did visit us on one occasion. 
Um, and I'm going to be very careful here, but this is part of my research, which, which I learned, is that she, um, though she was listed on census records as mulatto for a time, she was what is referred to as passable white. So there would be no question in my mind or my father's um, mind. Mm -hmm. Wow. So she, there were certain members that were that, who could visit, I want to put it that way, um, and then there were other members I knew nothing about. Right, and, uh, and this was to keep her anonymity, really. Yes, absolutely. Now, now that I know, yes. Right, and then so you fast forward into a, a woman who really wants to find out about the lineage and and your ancestors and your mother's family, and you start to you start to do the research. Talk about that. Okay. Um, when I started this, it was purely curiosity about my grandfather. I had no inkling at all about anything. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. So when I went, uh, and, and this was done in 1995, so this is before Ancestry.com, before the Internet. So I drove to our local family history center. It wasn't too far away from me. I live in Illinois. So when I started, and you had to use microfilm, so I'm going through microfilm. At first, I can't find Azima. My mother didn't know when he was born, didn't know when he died. So that's kind of a tough way to research because you have very little to go on. So finally, I put in the 1900 Louisiana census records, and I find the Fredericks, and they're spelled with a C at the end, not a K, which my mother always said to me, we don't have a K because that would make us German. We are French. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I said, great, I think I found them. Uh -huh. So I go all the way to the bottom of that list of Fredericks, and I find Aziman, and he's two years old, and he's listed as a granddaughter. So I thought, oh, well, they make mistakes. Right. Then I noticed that next to his name is a B. And then I go, start to go up the column of Fredericks because I want to see what, what column I'm in. And they all have Bs. And I look at the column title and it's race. And I just And so at that moment, at that moment, Dr. Lukasik, Lukasik, at that moment, what are you thinking? I'm shocked. I'm thinking, all right, does this mean B for black? I mean, then I'm the the you know the academic in me says, well, no, they in 1900 they wouldn't be using B for black. Right. That would be an incorrect designation. So um, I went over to the woman who was running the center. She was helping us, and I asked her. I said, well, I just found something interesting. All my relatives in the 1900 census have a, a race listing of B for black. Is that is that, could that be for black? Oh, yes. She got very straight in her chair. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. that's black. We, those are copied. We copied that. Then, to my shock, she launches into a tirade of racial slurs in front of me, which I was speechless. And I started to say something like, well, you have to understand, in Louisiana, this is the one drop rule. That incited her even more. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yes, that's right. That's right. And I won't say what she said, but you read the book. Right. And you and you and you you express it very vividly in the book. Let me get a break here, Dr. Lukasik. Okay. But when we come back, we're going to have more of this incredible story. The book is entitled White Like Her, My Family's Story of Race and Racial Passing. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Dr. Gail Lukasik, and her book is White Like Her, My Family's Story of Race and Racial Passing. And, and Dr. Gail, it's not just your story. It's a lot of stories, stories that have yet to be uncovered, some that are uncovered. But, you know, this is really not uncommon in Louisiana at all, which you would later find out. And so I want to take you back to the library and the librarian. When you, when you say, you know, you, you go into the library to do this research and you go in fully confident about who you are and what your race is. But after 
seeing the black designation or the the race as as black and talking to this librarian you feel what after that well i felt very confused um i also felt very defensive i'm just finding out something about my family I, which i knew nothing about and i want to defend them i, I that, that was my feeling it's like and, and she also brought in, um, oh, so you're the one with slaves in your family. And I don't know anything about my family. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it was, the, it just threw me. It totally threw me. And I had to um, get a presence of mind for myself. And I, I wanted to get away from that woman, obviously, as quickly as I could. So when I left, I sat in the car for a few moments and just thought, what just happened? What has happened to me? Right. Um, am I white? Am I black? Am I mixed race? I, I have no idea what I am. It was, I was totally bewildered. And so as you sit with that by yourself, you, you get this news, and you really have opened Pandora's box, and all of the questions that you have been asking since you were a girl, I'm sure all of that floods back at, at that point, or does it? No, it does. And my first thought is, I have to talk to my mother, but I need more information before I do. Mm. Because knowing my mother, <laughs> as I do, if, if, why hasn't she told me this? So, you know, obviously she's keeping it secret. Um, so I, I wanted to get a little more information before I talked to her. And I didn't want to have the conversation on the phone. Mm -hmm. I really wanted her to, I wanted to see her when I when I question her about this and then you do question her about this tell us about that moment okay is it still is, it, I, is that moment still tough Gail yes it is it's very tough it, it it's extremely tough because that was a pivotal changing point in my life I'm sure for my mother so I, um, we sat down I said, Mom, I discovered something about your father. And I told her about the census rec uh, told her about the census records. I told her about that I wrote away for her birth certificate. And I said, you know, Mom, on your birth certificate it says C O L for colored. Well, she got very indignant with me. And I could just see her spine go very straight in the chair and she said, I don't know what birth certificate you have, but mine says white. So I said, well, I have a letter from the state of Louisiana that confirms this. So at that point, she became very quiet. And she seemed to, as if she had sort of shrinking into herself. And she looked at me and she said, how will I ever hold my head up with my friends again? It broke my heart for her to say that. It really did. And I tried to say, Mom, this is nothing to be ashamed of. This is something wonderful. I, I was trying to ease her fear or shame or whatever she was feeling. And that's when she said, you have to promise me you will never tell anyone until I die. Mm. And I, did not want, I did not want to make that promise. And, and what's that moment like? Because you're torn, but you see... And, and, and I, at that moment when you write and you describe, I could almost see your mother shrinking into that small person that she's been hiding and right. living this lie her whole life. And now it's exposed. So she's got a lot of feelings of uncertainty and, and shame or guilt or whatever they are, but you've got some feelings as well, and then you're made to keep this promise. What are you thinking at that particular moment? Are you thinking, how, do, how will I ever keep this secret? I thought I could keep the secret. My point was, I didn't want to keep the secret. And I, my mother raised me to be respectful of all people, regardless of color. So it was, for me, a conflict. I, 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 I couldn't put the two mothers together mm. at that moment. The mother who had raised me and then the mother who has 
mixed race heritage not wanting to talk about it or or let me talk about it. So I was in a conflict at that moment. Um, and, and it was, but I, I've never seen my mother so afraid. She was a brave woman and she was very afraid. So within your own feelings, is there animus? Is there some anger on your part that she lived her whole life? And because you were, as in the book you write, it's almost like you're her confidant. Like I am. She, she, she comes to you and, and she asks you things. Is there for you, is there a time where you can really feel what you feel? You feel angry? Do you feel hurt? Do you feel let down? Was there a time like that for you? I've been asked about the anger. And it's almost as if people expect me to be angry, but I wasn't angry. Um, I was sad, conflicted, confused, um, hurt. I was hurt that, you know, after that, I tried over the years before she passed to talk to her again about it, and she would always change the subject. That hurt me a lot because I had been very good at keeping her secret. I told my husband, my two children, and two close friends, and that was it. No one ever knew. So I kept up my bargain. I did. I was, I was true to my mom. I did what she wanted. Um, I didn't feel it was my right to, do, to not keep that secret. She had sacrificed a lot to keep it, and um, so I was going to honor that. And then you could sort of feel what she may have felt and, and did feel before she made the decision to pass. You could feel that in the librarian. This is 1996. And then in the book, you even write about some of your dad, your dad's sort of um, racial animus. And so you could really, you know, with all of that and living this life, did it make it easier to understand why she would not divulge this secret? Absolutely. Absolutely. My father was a product of his own upbringing. So he was a bigot. He had, you know, he was a racist. She had to live with that. She had to live. She had to hear that. It was not like it went on every day. But I mean, we heard it. Right. And she would try to um, tell him, like, not to say those things. Or, she would try to balance it because she, she understood she had she had that. Um, understanding of living in both worlds. That is such a good way to put it. And I, and I think for people of mixed race who are passing for white, this is the struggle. You, you've just nailed it. That, that's exactly right. They have to live in both worlds. Yeah. Let me get a break here, Dr. Lukasik. But when we come back, we'll talk about the Genealogy Roadshow and how your family and your mother's history all comes full circle and comes right here to Alexandria, Louisiana. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. What a very dense, very rich story. A lot of people, Dr. Gale, will kind of liken it to um, imitation of life, that story of, of racial passing. Um, but the book is it's a history lesson for all of us. And we can feel your heart and we can even feel your mother's heart in this book. And so when you make a decision that you have sort of hit a brick wall in your own research, the Genealogy Roadshow comes into, into, your, uh, into your realm of possibility. Tell us about that. This is so serendipitous, and I, and I feel there's been a guiding spirit throughout this whole journey. It's probably my mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, three months after she passed, my husband happens to see a listing in our library newsletter that Genealogy Roadshow is looking for family mysteries, and one of the cities is New Orleans. So I applied online thinking... So what, what, be before you apply, though, Dr. Gale, your yes. husband, you and your husband, your husband finds, 
you know, this article that they're looking for stories. What do you and he have a conversation about? OK, I'm going to apply, but if I apply, you know, our whole lives and things that we don't even know about ourselves may come out. Do y'all ever have that conversation? We probably should have had that conversation, <laughs> but we didn't. He just said, maybe you'll find out the truth of your mother's heritage once and for all. So he was encouraging me. So He's even good. though, but even though you knew that your mother had been des designated black or colored or both. Right. Did you still as living your life as a, a Anglo-Saxon woman? Yeah. Did you really, really want to know? I mean, I did. yeah, I did. I really did want to know. Um, a lot of times I have this kind of personality that I'll do things on a lark thinking they'll never happen. <laughs> and gosh, it did happen. <laughs> it did happen. And then your family, you get chosen, your story gets chosen. And you're not really sure what the revelations will be. They refuse to tell you because they want you to have a spontaneous reaction while they're filming. So we had no idea. Lamont Westmoreland, who was one of the producers, just kept saying to me, you have an A story. So I thought, A, hey, that's good. <laughs> you have an A. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and, and so they revealed things to you. Were you able to really feel in that moment when um, Kenyatta says to you, you write in the book and people who watch the show, you know, these revelations are coming up. How apprehensive are you? at that moment before the revelation of the fact that you realized that your mother had been passing all these years? At the moment when it's happening, I'm good. Mm -hmm. It was the night before. I did not sleep the night before. I tossed and turned most of that night. Um, but once you're there and you're, you know, you're, you got your makeup on and you're all ready to go, it's like, okay, let's find out. I'm just excited and I just want to know. But I have to say, the first document she opens, I think it was one of the first, um, I was surprised. It was the 1940 Louisiana census. And on that one, my mom is designated NEG, which is for Negro. Mm -hmm. So that was the confirmation. That was what does your heart do at that moment? It's a lot happening at once, because then they move forward. And um, I think on the show, they showed a segment about um, passing for white, they explained it and things like that. So a lot's going on. I'm, I'm taking it, sort of taking it in, but not really, I don't think, at the moment. Though there is, do you want me to talk about the moment where I really did get upset? Sure. Because I, I was doing pretty good, and then Kenyatta revealed that my grandfather had a second family. And not only did he have a second family, he had five children with his second wife. That's where I almost started crying because it, that's when it hit me that my mother had felt abandoned by her father her whole life. And she had been moved from one relation to another. She never had a stable home. And my heart was breaking for her. How awful. And she must have thought he had abandoned her. I won't give it away, but in the book, I've wasn't the whole story, and that made me personally feel better. Yeah. But it's too late for her. Sure. Do you think for your mother that telling this story was almost like a healing for her, for all these years, all of the pain? I mean, she carried pain that you could have never known. Not, not just the pain of passing for white, but the pain of abandonment, the pain of loss, losing her family, you know, never really going back to her roots. Was it sort of like, like a healing and a, a reckoning, if you will, for your mother? I, I do believe that. I feel uh, it was redemptive for her and for all people of mixed race who have to who have to make that choice and for whatever reason they choose to um, pass for white. 
which right. I think is a very painful decision. Sure. And so after this show airs with, with all of these revelations, you get a call or an email, excuse yeah. me, from yes. Stephanie Frederick, who is from Alexandria, Louisiana, who heard <laughs> her dad's name mentioned <laughs> in your family story. Talk about that. Oh, wow. Um, the show aired on a Tuesday. I opened my email. I was get up early on Friday morning, and I'm looking through my email, and I see Stephanie Frederick's name, and I go, my heart stopped because I knew this is a Frederick person. Right. So I start reading her email, and she said she saw someone saw the show, told her about it. Her dad is Azima Frederick Jr., and then she said, I want to welcome you to the family. That's what she said to me. I had tears streaming down my face. She was so warm and welcoming. And, and then I think an hour later, I received another email from a woman who said, I'm your Aunt Alma. And she welcomes me to the family. So we um, decided to talk that day. We talked for over an hour. And it was wonderful. It had to be a revelation for them because Stephanie's dad was in that family that was too sort of just left. Yes. Um, once I met everyone at the welcome home party in New Orleans, I learned that they didn't know I existed. They didn't know about my grandfather's first family. So somehow these families just drifted apart for whatever reason and didn't, we didn't know of each other's existence, which is just amazing. And so you write in the book, Dr. Gale, that you are really an introvert and you're a writer. And I can imagine, and I felt this in reading the book, that Stephanie says, you know, we're going to drop everything. When are you going to be in New Orleans? I'm going to be there. She was on a movie shoot. And then there was another, um, was it the, an aunt or someone that says, I'm going to drop everything and I'm going to be there. And then you, you, you know, because you were kind of going to New Orleans as a pilgrimage for yourself, it sounded like, just to, to see if you could feel the essence of your mother and where she had come from. And then you have suddenly all of, <laughs> all of these family members Oh, it was a bit overwhelming. And then, of course, Stephanie, because, you know, she's a, a film producer, said, well, we have to document this. We, I'm thinking documentary, you know. And so not only am I meeting all these new people that, that I'm related to, I have a camera guy following me around just about everywhere I go. It was, it was a bit unnerving. I, I could imagine, I could feel that, I could feel your inner self cringing because, you know, you've opened up this story and then you've opened up yourself to, though they're your family, you've never met them. And I'm sure it was great and just a lot of, a bevy of, of emotions all, all at once. But believe me, wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I came away from that weekend walking on air. Wow. It was so great. And I have to say, because I know people hear about reunions and, oh, you have one and then that's it. Well, we had another one <laughs> in Philadelphia. And we have another one planned for next year. And I think it's going to be in California. Well, so, well tell us yeah. about, you know, before you've got to go, and we're so out of time, but you got to tell this before you go. There's going to be, Stephanie is doing a documentary and yes. there's, always, there's also going to be, as I understand it, a movie. Well, we hope. Um, Stephanie's throwing a huge book launch party in Los Angeles at the Soho House. And we're going to be inviting movers and shakers, which we hope will, you know, drum up a lot of interest in sure. either a documentary and or, I should say, uh, a movie. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Gale, for you, how cathartic has this been? Very. It's been very cathartic. I still struggle. I'm going to be honest. It, it's, it's still a struggle for me. Um, but I know that I'm doing the right thing. I know that. Dr. Gail Lukasik has been, Dr. Gail Lukasik has been our guest this morning. The book, White Like Her, My Family's Story of Race and Racial Passing. Give us your website and how people can get the book. It's www.gaillukasik.com. 
Dr. Or you can go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Absolutely. Dr. Gale, thank you so much for sharing your family's triumph and hope. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. Stay on point, everybody. We're back right after this. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Carlette Christmas. And I'm Glenda Stock, and this is our final point today on Point. Some very deep and impactful stories that we've had the opportunity to share. We want to thank our guest this morning, Dr. Gail Lukasik. Her book is called White Like Her, My Family's Story of Race and Racial Passing. And, you know, as we were sitting and listening to Gail's story, we understand, especially in the South, how this is not really a news flash. This right. is something that has happened and really continues to happen. And, and probably, as we said, offset happens more than, than we can even imagine. Um, but to have her recant her story and talk about it, you can really put yourself in her shoes mm -hmm. and uh, understand, you know, how unsettling <laughs> this had to be. And, and you know, I, my heart kind of goes out to her. You know, as a child, it's apparent that she, she had to live a life really and truly, uh, and, and she didn't understand it at the time because she was a child, but she was sort of a bondage and, and mm -hmm. hostile, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, hostility because her, her mom's decision, right. you know, to, to hide this mm -hmm. and, and to not uh, feel the freedom to, to show her, her heritage. Um, what, what a, you know, what a mixed message and, and what a, you know, kind of a rough journey when you think about it, it is. you know, I mean, um, it would have been very, very easy, um, uh, for Dr. Gale to have really been resentful and angry and bitter and, um, and all of the above, Absolutely. you know, to her mom and her dad. Mm -hmm. Um, I just can't even fathom you know, how, how she was able to cope with that and later. I and I think, you know, just after, you know, we were talking to her after the show, and I think that there's still a great process yes. going on within her. But I think her lack of bitterness and anger comes because she knew that her mother had struggled yeah. her whole life. Yeah. And then when she made that decision to cross that color line and never go back, she relinquished everything. Yeah, yeah. She cut off arms and legs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in a metaphorical way, and uh, you know that's that's huge. And and you know we have our own lives, and we can only imagine. You know, we know the value of, of our family and our lives and, mm -hmm. and our heritage and, and knowing those things. Um, but it, it's, it's another journey and she's right. I, you know, I think her heart was broken for her mother because she Absolutely. began to really see how painful her upbringing had been mm -hmm. and how painful her whole life, frankly, had been because she had had to remove herself from, from the reality of her world. And then it was, it was really a painful life, I think, for Gail growing up because as I said in the interview, she became her mother's confidant. Yeah. And her mother just had so much tumult in her life. And, and when we- It was we, a big burden. It was a big burden. Yeah. And then when we bestow that on our kids, sometimes without yeah. knowing, you know, we give that burden over to them. And she talked about what the perception of many people would be. Why would she tell this story? Yeah. But unless you don't know where you've come from and you don't know your people and your family, you really can't sit in judgment. No, no. And, and you know, honestly, when you hear the rest of the story, so to speak, uh, how she has opened windows and, and doors of knowledge for herself right. that's allowed her to have an extended family that, mm -hmm. you know, should have had in her life all, all along, along. Uh, and how joyous that has been for her. You know, it, it seems, frankly, to, to be, to add a completeness, you know, to right. her life. It seemed as though she spent many of her years searching mm -hmm. for, for answers and completeness. She felt a void. Right. You know, it, it seemed apparent that she was on a mission early on and, and felt a void. And so having made that step, and, and, you know, I admire her courage for honoring her mother's wish 
um, it, it's kind of sad to me, honestly, that that it could not have been revealed while her mom was alive. Mm -hmm. Because look at the joy, right? Look at the joy that her mom could have had. That's right. By reuniting and and finding family that mm -hmm. she had been, you mm -hmm. know, removed from all those years. And 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 understanding the totality, yeah, of the story. And her mother missed that, but. I think for Dr. Lukasik, the bigger the bigger conversation here yes. is about race right. and having the conversation and and all of us thinking that because we identify or our skin color says right we think that that's the whole story right yeah and yeah. it's not for no. many of us yeah. and so a lot of apprehension about sharing her family story and the process right but it is a book that really takes you back into uh the 30s and the 40s yes. and and yeah. she was able to recount a lot of the stories that her mother would tell her from new orleans and and she wanted to find that she yeah. wanted to find out who to she know was. her history yeah. yeah yeah and her lineage and and again and and you know we have to know that that in her mom's heart i'm sure she she did too, you know. It, right. it was a lonely, a lonely mm -hmm. path for her, mm -hmm. and a lonely choice. I mean, you know, a very lonely choice because here she was hiding this secret from two people in her life that meant the most to her. Absolutely. You know, her daughter and her husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how, you know, how much joy could come from that? Um, but a, a great story, and I think a great, a great example of of really realizing that, you know, we are created by the same God. That's and right. that we are created as one race. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, just because our skin color is different, why and should we continue to allow ourselves to be influenced in all walks of our life as a result of that? Uh, I think it's a powerful message and a powerful story, and I think that's exactly what Dr. Gale is trying mm -hmm. to have people know and Absolutely. see. Absolutely, look at me, and and we see the, you know, ultimate white American lady. Absolutely. Uh, and you Midwestern, said China white. China white. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, uh, what a beautiful story! Mm -hmm. What a beautiful story uh, there is here to to be heard. And uh, how many people, you know, could possibly have the same story? It kind of makes you want to dig deeper. It does make you wonder. And I'm going to tell you one thing. It should give us all a greater appreciation for humanity. Yes. And knowing that we really right. don't know. And were it not for Gail's curiosity, she's a mystery writer, to say the least. Wow. Having to unravel her own family's history. Uh, it's an incredible story. It brings us to Alexandria, Louisiana. And to the Frederick family here, we're grateful that we all have connected and that we were able to share this amazing story. It, it's a beautiful story, and we hope you'll get the book. Even There's so much more for you to, to know mm -hmm. uh, in, in this book and, and understand about this story and how compelling uh, it really is. And, and I think it, you know, it can open your mind and your heart to a new way of thinking, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. And it's quite possible that we're all mixed with something. I'm sure we are. We are, absolutely. I know you and I are sisters. <laughs> Somehow, we are sisters. Sisters from another mother. <laughs> absolutely. The book is called White Like Her, My Family's Story of Race and Racial Passing. I'm Carlette Christmas. And I'm Glenda Stock. And this has been our final point today on Point. Stay with us, everybody. We're back to wrap up right after this.